Hey, morning, and it's Let's Chat time. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. It's wonderful to be able to connect with you and to be able to just say hi from my side. And I'm very excited just to be sharing with you today and just sharing with you on my heart today. But I must confess, I've come to you today with a little bit of a saddened heart because there's something that I need to talk to you about which has saddened me. I'm just putting my volume up on my... On my um, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, good morning. It's Wednesday. It's Let's Chat. My recording's happening. And now I can chat with you. But before I do, I just want to open in prayer. And I just want to ask the Holy Spirit to brood here and to brood where you are so that you can just be so aware of His incredible goodness. Holy Spirit, thank you for just brooding in this place. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Jesus, that you hold the keys to unlock our hearts, to unlock doors that no man can shut and to, uh, to lock doors that no man can open. And I want to ask you for the brooding of your presence. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance, O Lord. It's your kindness that unlocks and opens our hearts where we've hardened them so that your beauty, your love, your purity and your spirit can come in and come and bring healing and restoration. And that's my prayer for today. I really ask that in your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, you know, this week something happened that really just sat in my heart a little bit. And so I'm going to share that experience with you because I think it's really important to understand. I saw a friend this week that I hadn't seen for a very long time, maybe 20 years. And when I saw them, I was so happy to see them because I hadn't seen them for so long. And it was just so good to be able to see her and just to be able to say, hi, how are you? And I went to give her a big, big, big hug. And as I hugged her, she responded to the hug. And then she said this to me, I'm very happy to see you, but I have something to talk to you about. And I said, yeah, sure, let's chat. And then she went on to say, you don't know this, but something happened about 20 years ago that offended me deeply. And I've never been able to forgive you for that. Wow. I was flabbergasted. Honestly, I didn't know what she was talking about. Anyway, then she went on in great detail. And friends, this is what I want you to understand. When we harbor offense, we remember facts and details to the tiniest little measure that are not necessarily true. But because we have overthought it so many times, we've brooded on it so many times, it's gone over and over and over and over again in our imagination and in our thoughts and in our feelings that we have made this stronghold, this castle of unforgiveness and offense that is our reality. But it's not the reality of the situation. And she went on to unpack it and I listened to her and after a long period of time, maybe about 35 minutes or 40 minutes, eventually I said, may I say something? And she said, sure. And I said, I'm so desperately sorry I offended you. But actually, you didn't have all, the, all the, the pieces. You didn't know all the truth. And the truth was this. And she just looked at me and she said, I didn't know that. But I forgive you. And that was the end. She forgave me. And, and we were able to pray together and it was finished. Friends, for 20 years it had harbored in her heart. For 20 years she'd been bitter and upset and, and bitterness draws more bitterness. So the list of offended people goes on and on and on. For 20 years she walked around with a pain in her heart that she had built a stronghold out of against me. And she didn't even know the actual facts of why things happened the way that they did. And when I explained to her, it was like, oh, and it was over. And my heart broke for her friends. My heart broke because for 20 years she has lived in bitterness over something that didn't need more than one minute to explain. And as I was pondering on that and just praying for her and just feeling so desperately sad for her. And the result of that is that she's now having to have all kinds of treatment and medication for depression and for all kinds of fears and anxieties. And the root of it is unforgiveness rooted in offense. And as I was pondering on that, I felt God say, you need to talk about it 
because it's rough in my body. It's rough among my people. And so friends, today it's a little sober, but I want to talk to you about offense. What are you harboring? What are you holding in your heart? What are you growing into a stronghold that is actually just a misunderstanding? You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 16, Above all, take the shield of faith which you are able to put out with which you are able to put out the flaming arrows of the evil one. Friends, offense is a poisonous flaming arrow. That's what it is. It's a poisonous flaming arrow. And the trouble is that most of the time when we offend it, it is a miscommunication. It's a different expectation or a different perspective. It is a preoccupation with other things. That might make you feel people don't care about you when they just occupied on something else. So just because they don't respond immediately or, you know, the the cell phone. The cell phone and somebody sends a message and you open it and you read it and you think, Oh, I can't answer that straight away because I'm busy with another person. I'll get back to it. And because you have not responded in a moment to their request, which is coming into your day, which is full and you're trying to balance all the balls, they get offended because you've blue ticked them. Friends, this is crazy. The body of Christ is full of offense. The last year, God said that the enemy has released a greater anointing of a demon of offense into the world. Friends, we cannot allow that to grip our hearts. It says in Song of Solomon 2 verse 15, Catch the foxes for us. The little foxes that destroy the vineyard, our vineyard, that is in bloom. Friends, and this is talking about relationships. It's talking about the relationship between the lover and he's, and he's the person that he absolutely dotes on in Song of Solomon 2 verse 15. But it's talking about relationships. The word foxes means little burrowing offenses or little burrowing things that burrow into your heart. Catch them. When do they come and burrow? When the vineyard is in bloom, when there's something that's about to open into something beautiful and fruitful, that's when the enemy sends offenses, friends. The word destroy or spoil, it means to bind it, to stop it from coming into full bloom, to destroy it, to spoil it, to cause offense, to deal with it corruptly, and to twist the truth. Friends, friends, offense is a twisted truth. Now, why do we get offended? Well, the truth of the matter is, it says in Romans 2 verse 1, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Why do we get offended? Because somebody is doing something that displeases us, but we do the same things. It says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28, everyone ought to examine themselves. You know, friends, I've often said this. If I'm feeling offended or hurt, and I, I'm not, I don't get easily hurt. In fact, it takes a lot to cause me to be hurt because honestly, I've learned to have a hippo hide on the outside. On the inside, I have this gentle spirit that is just so sensitive to the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to people, I am deaf and blind to them because I'm just not really that bothered about what they think. And so many things happen and I just think, oh, well, that's them. That's up to them. That's fine. But why is it that we do get offended or we do get hurt? Friends, you have to examine yourself. You see, I always say if an arrow comes and it takes a hold, what is the landing pad inside you that causes that arrow to take a hold? Remember, it's a misunderstanding. It's a different expectation. It is two different people looking at the same situation from different perspectives. It's very, very seldom that somebody will offend you because they deliberately want to offend you. It's very seldom. And even then, if they deliberately want to offend you, why are you offended? What has the landing pad inside your heart? Is it insecurities which cause us to want to strive and to be recognized? Is it your own rejection that you've lived under so you're wearing glasses and you're seeing everything about everybody's trying to hurt me, everybody's doing this to me, the whole world is against me because you are the one suffering from rejection 
Is that what it is? Is it an old, undealt with wound? You know, sometimes we've been hurt by a parent that abandoned us, a father that walked out, or a mother that did something that was terrible, that caused great deep pain, and we don't allow that wound to be healed. And then we go into a situation where a boss or a pastor says something, and it lands on that old rotten wound inside of us, and then we are offended, and we label them all the same. And that is what a misogynist is. It's somebody that hates all women because of one woman that hurt them or somebody that hates all men because of one man that hurt them or somebody that has an issue with all figures of authority because of one person and authority that hurt them and so it lands on an old wound and so you react and you blame them but the issue isn't them the issue is what is in your heart what is the landing pad in your heart Sometimes because of abandonment, we truly believe everyone's going to abandon us. And so the smallest thing that happens is we, th we see it as abandonment and we hurt and we offended. And we either end up in a huge big rage over nothing or we storm out and we have nothing more to do with them. Friends, we have to understand this. Sometimes it's because we've experienced injustice. Friends, why do you get offended? If you've experienced injustice... You need to come before the Father and you need to say, God, that's injustice. It's wrong. But you're the God of justice and I'm releasing it to you. And I thank you that you're going to bring order into disorder and you're going to bring justice. And therefore, I can hand it over to you and I can trust you that you're going to do something. And you allow him to wash you clean of the pain of that injustice, friends. Sometimes it's arrogance. It's your arrogance. It's you thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to. The Bible says in Romans 12, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Do not think you're more important than you really are. Friends, the truth of the matter is none of us are important. We're all just sinners destined for eternal hell. And the most amazing thing is that God through his kindness sent Jesus and he saved us. And it's Jesus working through us. That is, it's our anointing that makes a way for us. And I want to say this, friends, you're nothing. I'm nothing. But for Jesus, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Sometimes it's entitlement. Because we've been indulged and spoiled as a child and we believe it's our right to demand things. No, friends, it's not your right. Sometimes it's indignation. Why do you get offended? Self-importance is a terrible thing. Sometimes it's jealousy and envy. The Bible says where there's envy and jealousy, there's every form of evil practice. Friends, the truth of the matter is a critical person is a person that's got a wounded heart. And if you're always seeing everything negatively and criticizing people, it's because your heart is wounded. And that's when you get easily offended. And God wants to deal with that offense. The Bible says in Proverbs 14 that envy rots, uh, rots the bones. Right into your marrow, your bones get rotten. Now, friends, what happens if we don't deal very quickly with offense? Well, the first thing we have to understand that offense always brings seven other demonic forces with us. Offense is it believing a deception a lie or a falsehood which is a spirit of a, a deception or a spirit of falsehood and then we land on that and we believe it and we open up our hearts to receive all the other demons that are attached to that and that's how our heart gets hardened and that's how we lose the grace that God has offered us it says in Hebrews 12 verse 2 and verse 15 let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Offense is a sin, friends. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Friends, Jesus saw it as joy 
to take your offense, your pain, your wounds, my offense, my pain, my wounds upon himself. With every beating, he took it for you. With every lashing, he took it for me. When they pulled the hair out of his beard, he did it so that you don't have to suffer that. When they kicked him, when they beat him, when they punched him, when his eyes were swollen, when his body was bleeding, when he was carrying that cross and the splinters were, were plugging flesh out of his shoulder, when those whips were just pulling flesh out of his back that was absolutely torn and raw and broken. He did it for joy of you not having to walk that way. And when we get offended, friends, and when we allow ourselves to stay wounded and no one can get into that picture and no one can come in and say, you've got a wounded heart, let me help you heal it because then you get offended. Friends, we're saying, Jesus, your cross was not enough for me. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble and defiles many. Friends, where there's offense, it develops into full bitterness if it's not dealt with. It causes trouble wherever that goes. Wherever you are, there's trouble. Wherever you are, there's chaos. Wherever you are, there's confusion because there's no peace within you. And therefore, you don't walk in peace and you usher in the confusion that's within you. And then that bitterness defiles many. Because unfortunately, a bitter person usually ends up telling everybody else, about the offense, but they don't go to the one who offended them. And we have to understand what it is God has got for us. So the first thing about offense is that it ushers in deception. You're believing a lie. If you're offended, you're believing a lie. I want to tell you now, if you're offended, and I'm speaking to somebody today, I'm speaking to more than one person today. If you're offended, you are believing a lie. You're believing a perspective that you have seen, but it's not the full picture. The Bible says in Proverbs, Proverbs 26, verse 24 to 26, A malicious man disguises himself with his lips, but in his heart he harbors deceit. Though his speech is charming, do not believe him, for seven abominations fill his heart. His malice may be concealed by deception, but his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. The King James says it like this, He who hates pretends with his lips and stores up deceit within him. When he makes his voice gracious, do not believe him, for seven abominations are in his heart. He whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be shown before the congregation. Deuteronomy 29 verse 18 to 20 says, Make sure that no man or woman plan family or tribe among you today whose hearts turn away from the Lord your God to go and worship the gods of this nation make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison such when such a person hears the words of his oath and invokes blessings on himself and therefore thinks I will be safe I will have peace even though I persist in going my own way in walking in the imagination of my own heart. This will bring disaster on the water, on the land, as well as on the dry land. The Lord will never be willing to forgive his wrath and his zeal will burn against him. All the curses written in this book will fall on him and the Lord will blot his name out from under heaven. Hebrews 10 verse 26 and 7 says, If you deliberately keep on sinning after you've received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice of sin is left, but only the fearful expectation of judgment and the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Friends, see that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble and defiles many. Offense is a poisonous, fiery arrow that burrows into our heart it takes a hold of our imagination it burrows into our heart it consumes our thoughts it affects the way we feel and eventually it will affect the way we behave and i want to tell you now friends if there is unforgiveness in your heart and you allow the seven abominations to develop and grow within you 
you will become physically sick you will become emotionally sick you will need to be treated for depression for fear for all those horrible mental illnesses that they try and drug us with but they don't deal with the bottom heart the bottom issue the problem that's really caused this and the worst of it all the worst you will have your name removed and blotted out of the lamb's book of life because all that will be left is the fiery promise of eternal destiny with the enemy this is so serious friends and the body of christ is full of offense you know the world doesn't know any better they haven't received the gracious repentance and love and the sacrifice of jesus christ they have not received the grace that's been offered to every one of us friends but we have absolutely no excuse we are not allowed to be offended because it means we think of ourselves more highly than we think of others now when we believe a deception you're believing a half truth in your own head where the enemy has come to lie to you he did it to eve and he tried to do it to jesus and you are definitely not beyond him deceiving you a spirit of falsehood the bible says a spirit of falsehood cannot enter into the kingdom of god in revelations with that unforgiveness settles friends the bible says in matthew 6 if you do not forgive god can not forgive you the next abomination that takes a hold is resentment then you start plotting how to get back at them you resent them you resent their blessings you resent their good things that happen in their life you resent you are jealous of them you you want what they've got you resent the very fact that they're breathing you resent everything about them you look at them with with resentment in your heart and then retaliation starts and you start plotting and planning retaliation the bible says that god vengeance belongs to the lord it doesn't belong to us friends and god's greatest vengeance is against the enemy he took paul saul paul the man that was killing the christians by the thousands he took him and the greatest vengeance that God had was the moment that he arrested Paul. He gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ and the cross. And the very Paul that was used in the hands of the enemy to destroy the Christian world, God turned it around and his greatest vengeance was against the enemy when that same Paul ended up not only reaching the generation of his time but writing most of the new testament books so that we can know our beautiful lord jesus christ as well and it is paul that has great had written the greatest message in the new testament other than jesus of understanding how to forgive in the fullness of our understanding and destiny as sons of god with our hearts so full of love, friends, that the only thing that we feel towards those with unforgiveness in their heart is compassion. But they start retaliating. Evil, evil wickedness is brooding because these demonic strongholds are coming in one after the other. The demons are finding habitation. And then rage takes a hold. Friends, a spirit of rage, the Bible says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil a foothold. Rage is a demon. And it takes a hold and it gets into blind rage where you lose it and the demon takes over. And you have no control over your mouth and over your actions and you destroy people. And you know what? People enjoy their rage because it gives them power. And it makes others scared of them. But by the time, time rage has taken a hold, the spirit of deception is operating. The spirit of unforgiveness is operating. The spirit of re resentment is operating. The spirit of retaliation is operating. And now the spirit of rage has taken over. And friends, the next thing that comes in is a spirit of hatred. And then we hate people. We hate them. Prejudice is a hatred. Gender prejudice is a hatred. But you've already got six demons operating by the time hatred has filled your life. If you cannot look at another person created in the image of likeness of God and feel deep compassion for them, but you feel hatred and resentment towards them, my friends, it's time to repent because you are seriously in a bad way. And the Father is weeping over you. And when I had this sadness and this compassion for this poor woman whose life has been ruined for 20 years because of a misunderstanding. That's how the father looks at us friends. And hatred has filled her heart. One offense will lead to a second offense, a third offense, a fourth offense, a fifth offense. 
And by the time you've harbored all these offenses against all these people, you are deeply in trouble. Because these demonic strongholds have taken over your heart. The Bible calls them seven abominations have taken a hold of your heart. And when hatred comes, the next thing is murder. And you know, friends, the Bible says if you think it, you're doing it. If you're murdering somebody in your mind, you're murdering them in reality. If you're murdering somebody with your mouth, by speaking negatively about them, by gossiping about them, breaking them down. You are murdering them. You are destroying them. If you're thinking it, you're doing it. And it's not good enough to just think it and do it. That's when people start planning it. And you know what, friends? That's where serial killers come from. There are people so crippled by the hatred of bitterness and bitterness is seven demons controlling our hearts. It starts off with a deception. And the longer it's there, and the deception is an offense, and the longer it's there, unforgiveness takes a hold, resentment takes a hold, retaliation takes a hold, rage takes a hold, hatred takes a hold. And then you start killing people. In your thoughts, in your mouth, and ultimately, even to the point of physically planning their death and killing them or if you don't kill them you kill people that remind you of them that is the tragedy friends of what deep the deepness of bitterness is and friends we don't have the privilege of harboring any of that because the moment we do we put ourselves back in the state of the world that we were in before we accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior you see bitterness hinders the person's relationship with the Lord and eventually arrests their ministry, their work and their effectiveness and they can no longer be effective for God. And then people take that away from them because they're causing more harm than good and then they're offended because somebody touched their ministry. God will not allow you to touch his sheep with a hard and bitter heart. Bitterness is an open door for the enemy to have his full legal right inside your heart. And it starts spewing out of you. No matter how nicely you smile, no matter how kindly you talk, it is a, it's an act, it's a mask, and it cannot last. Because squeeze you just a little bit, and what's going to come oozing out of your mouth is the evil that's taken a harshness and a, an occupation deep inside of you. Bitterness will eventually affect the person physically, and will eventually affect the person emotionally. They will become mentally ill, and they will become physically sick because it goes right into the bone and into the marrow. So many people are dying today of all kinds of diseases. There are some cancers. There are some autoimmune diseases. There are some um, allergies that are deeply rooted in bitterness. That is why the Bible says, if you have sinned, call the elders. Call those that are more mature in Christ. Let them pray over you, not for you over you let them ask God what is really operating here this is James 5 verse 16 13 to 16 and then it says you will be healed the effect of prayer of a righteous man availeth much but if you have sinned you will be forgiven what is the sin self-pity because of offense that is the sin friends we don't have that privilege because we died in Christ I'm a new creation in Christ I'm dead to the old person. I'm, I'm created in the new person. So when somebody says something that, that offends or that hurts or that's intended to hurt, and they come to the new creation and there's no platform for it to land on, I can smile and have compassion for them. Because that's what Jesus would do, friends. And it's Christ that lives in me. It's Christ that lives in me. Bitterness hurts and defiles many others. And that's where second-hand offenses come. You see, I'm offended, and I tell 10 other people that I'm offended with Joe Soap, and they all get offended because I'm offended with Joe Soap. They've got a second-hand offense. And do you know that a second-hand offense is much, much more difficult to find solution for because it didn't happen to them. They got offended because I was offended, because bitterness defiles many. And bitterness causes the person to lose the grace of God. That is the tragedy, friends. And that is the place that God is so heartbroken about. And friends, I want to say this to you. Deal with your unforgiveness. Deal with your offenses. Deal with the things that have crippled you and stopped you from being a mighty man and woman of God. 
Why are others taking the positions that you should have had? Because God can't trust you. Why are you not seeing God break through with the promises and the prophetic promises that he's had over his life? Because he cannot trust you. God looks at the heart. He does not look at the smile that we want the world to see. We want the world to see our mask. Friends, we've been behind physical masks, but the truth of the matter is we've been behind emotional masks for a very long time. You can look in somebody's eyes and it's the window to their soul. And you know what? God doesn't look at your mask. He looks right into your heart. He looks into the eyes, the window to the soul, and he sees what's sitting here. And God will not trust you with the sacredness of an anointed ministry, with the sacredness of looking after his sheep. And they're not yours, they're his. You may even pass through a church. They're not yours, they are his. If you have got a heart that is carrying aught, friends, examine yourself. Examine yourself. I examine myself all the time. God, have I picked up a fence? Have I got an attitude? Is there anything that you're not happy with? And friends, you know what? When we do that quickly, then we don't end up in trouble. So how do we manage offense? <clears throat> well, number one, it is vital that we communicate. It is absolutely vital. Now, God is so good because he's told us how to do it. And I'd love you, please, to turn to Matthew 18 if you've got your Bible. If you haven't, remember Matthew 18. And I'm going to read to you from 15. And it says this, if your brother sins against you, now that means makes a mistake, wrongs you or offends you. If your brother offends you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. Friends, if you're offended, it is your responsibility to communicate. With the one that has caused you offense, communicate with him. When you did this, when you said that, I was hurt. I'm sorry, but I need to come and talk to you about this because I need to find out. <coughs> Excuse me. Was that a miscommunication? Did I not understand clearly what was going on? Did the two of us have different expectations? You know how often, friends, we have different expectations? Somebody says, this is what I'd like you to do. You have an expectation of this is what they want. They have an expectation of this is what I want. It is vital to communicate. Was it a different perspective on something? Were they just too preoccupied to give you the full picture? Go and show them their fault. Just the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won your friend. You've won your brother over. And 90% of the offenses will be solved just there. I want to tell you that 90% of offenses will be solved just there. Before you've even spoken with anybody else. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along. So that in every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he still refuses to listen, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as a pagan or a tax collector. And what that means, treat him as someone who doesn't know God because he's not prepared to deal with this. And he's carrying aught and he's offended. Treat him as someone who doesn't know God. And what do we do with someone who doesn't know God, friends? We pray for them. We pray earnestly for them. That they can come into the revelation of who God is. You see, Jesus didn't come for the church. He came for the world. He came for the broken. He came for the healing. The church are walking as his entourage behind him. Doing the work that he did. And following through with what he did. And what do we do when someone doesn't know him? We reach out to them as if they've never met him. And that's what we're meant to do, friends. We're not meant to reject them. Jesus did not come to reject the people who don't know him. He came to draw them in and to love them and to save them. That's what he came for. Go to them. Have I misunderstood this? 90% of the problems will be solved there. If that lady had come to me 20 years ago, she would never have walked with a 20-year-old offense. Number two, if they don't listen, if they can't see it, if they're walking around with an offense, if their heart is broken, take a couple of witnesses who can actually just be a witness between you and say, you know what, Kathy, you're not communicating clearly because they see it from this perspective. You know what, Joseph, this is what Kathy means. Let's work this through together. And if there's still something, 
then you can take it further and treat them as if they just have no revelation of Jesus Christ. And therefore, you've got to pray for their salvation, for their eyes to be opened, because 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that the God of this world has blinded the people so they cannot see. Pray for their eyes to be opened. That's what our commission is. That's what we have to do, friends. So number one, communicate with them. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Gossip is easy. Communication is difficult. Communicate. Number two, come in the opposite spirit. Hebrews 12 says, um, and I've read it to you already, make every effort to live in peace. Friends, unforgiveness, bitterness, chaos brings chaos and confusion. The minds are active and cannot find peace. Make every effort to live in peace. If your mind is at peace, it is good with your soul. It is well with your soul. If your mind is not at peace, bring it into peace. Deal with your soul so that no root of bitterness can grow up. Um, uh, uh, Romans 12 verse 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know what, friends? Rejected people will reject. Don't operate in the same spirit. Reject them because they're rejecting you. Love them. Be kind to them. People that are bitter are unkind. Don't come in the same spirit. People that are bitter are cruel. Don't be cruel back. Don't see, well, how can I hurt them because they've hurt me? Come in the opposite spirit. We have to come in the opposite spirit so that we can keep peace and we can find harmony. Hold on to our faith against temptation and against the power of the enemy and against persecution. The Bible says, um, do not be overcome by evil. The word evil means a bad nature. The bad nature of the person, the bad nature of Satan. Bad behavior. Somebody who's injurious. Somebody who's wicked. Somebody who feels worthlessness. And somebody that comes to do harm. Do not come in the same spirit as that. Remember, we are to catch the small foxes. Catch them. Catch them quickly so that the bloom will not be destroyed. Then number three, we've got to see it from God's perspective. We've got to know that Jesus looks from above and he looks at you and he looks at them. When I'm looking at the situation from my perspective, I've got half the picture. When they're looking from their perspective, they've got half the picture. But when we look from God's perspective, we've got the whole picture, friends. And it's vital that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places and that we see things from God's perspective. It says in Joshua 5, verse 13 to 14, Joshua said to the angel of the Lord, Are you for us or are you against us? He looked at him because Israel was at war with another army. Are you for us or are you against us? Israel was at war with an ungodly army. You would think that God was on the side of Israel. And this was the response. Neither. As the captain of the Lord's army, I have come. Friends, no matter what we feel or think, God does not consider your enemy to be his enemy. God does not consider the person that has caused you pain to be an enemy. He loves them. He cares about them. If they don't know him, he wants to let them know him. If they do know him and their hearts are hardened, he's doing everything in his power to bring them back to him. Don't think because they're your enemy, they're his enemy. No, they are not. And we have to see it from his perspective. That's where his compassion takes over. That's when we know what God is feeling. That's when we are able to embrace and feel compassion toward them instead of hatred. I've shared this testimony before, friends, but for 20 years, I hated my stepfather because he'd molested me as a little girl. My heart was so bitter, so angry. I was so full of rage. I had so much brokenness. I hated him. And when the day came that Jesus said to me, Kathy, you've got to forgive him. And it was the hardest thing for me to do. I said, do you know what he did to me? Do you know what he did? And God said, yes, I do know what he did. And then he said this. He said, but Kathy, what you've done for the last 20 years has caused you more pain than what he did. That just broke my heart, friends. And that's when I could forgive him. And then I said, Jesus, don't let me see things from my perspective. Let me see it from your perspective. And you know what he did? He showed me that man as a little boy 
in an orphanage because he'd grown up in an orphanage, being hurt, rejected, molested, broken, without a father, without a mother, abandoned. And my heart broke for him. My heart broke for him. And suddenly I wasn't angry with him and I didn't hate him and I didn't think he was the most terrible person. Suddenly I wept over him and I cried out for mercy for him. And friends, that's what the compassion of Jesus Christ does when we are able to see it from God's perspective, friends. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Communicate. Come in the opposite spirit. See things from God's perspective. And suddenly everything will change. And suddenly you'll be able to feel the love of God, the compassion of God, the deep hunger of God for that person will absolutely overwhelm you. It's really, really important that we are able to love the way God loves and give the way God gives. Friends, we are in a time in the body of Christ where things are happening so quickly. We are in a time in the world where things are happening so quickly. People's hearts are failing them because of fear. There's so much evil. There's so much darkness. There's so much happening. People cannot keep up with what's happening. There's so much deception. There's so much fake news. We are not being told the truth. There are people standing up that are leading us that are deeply, deeply deceived. And it is time for the body of Christ to rise up in the fullness of everything she carries and be who God has called her to be. You are the one that has to rise up. I'm the one that has to rise up. The body of Christ is not an organization. It's individual people with a revelation of the love of the Father for the hurting, the broken, the lost, and the captive. And we cannot add to that pain by being hurt, broken, and captive ourselves, friends. We have to walk in the fullness of the love and the understanding and the compassion and the kindness of our Father. I spoke about Paul earlier and how God used Paul's life as vengeance against the enemy. And Paul wrote in Philippians 2, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Friends, it is a new era and it is a time to understand the level of forgiveness that the Father poured out on us for us to pour out generously, abundantly and graciously on those that have done all to us, whether they meant it or whether they didn't. Forgive them. Just forgive them. Because then your heart is free and you can walk in glory and you can walk in anointing and you can be who God called you to be. You know, in the 20 years that she had ought against me, I've lived free. And she has ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Friends, live free. The next thing is, it's time to humble ourselves, friends. It doesn't matter whether you are the president. It doesn't matter if you're the senior pastor. It doesn't matter if you're the most important VIP around there. Remember, you are one breath away from death because it only takes God to do this and you have no life. And the second thing is remember, you are who you are and you've done what you've done because he empowered you. Without him, you are nothing. I am weak, but he is strong. I, the weak one, can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The glory goes to Christ. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. It is time for the greatest humility we've ever understood. And it's not a piousness and it's not a false humility. It's just the revelation that I am nothing but for Christ. And anything I achieve, the glory goes to him. Because I, without him, is nothing. And then, friends, it's time. For radical love. It's time for the love of God 
to ooze out of you. It's time to be overflowing with the love of God. It's table time. It's time to receive it. It's time to drink it in. It's time to worship Him. And then it's time to walk around so that goodness and mercy can follow you everywhere you go because your heart has been consumed by love. Friends, please can I invite you if my message is spoken to you today, if you know that your critical heart is really an offended heart, if you've had murderous thoughts, hateful thoughts, if your mouth speaks bitterness and there's poison on your lips, just go and fall before the Father and say, I'm so, so, so sorry that your cross, your death and your suffering was not enough for me. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And friends, that's all it takes. And then release them, one after the other. And maybe you've got to go and repent to some people. And maybe you just have to release them and bless them. And wish them well. And bless their families. And bless everything that they do. Because a person that can bless is a person that's forgiven. Bless you, beautiful friends. I love you so much. I care about you so deeply. I just love the Christ in you. And my heart is just overwhelmed with the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I just want to say, don't let another day go by where the seven abominations have the right to hold your heart. God bless you.